They all generates enthusiasm. That was one of his great gifts, I think, to the Catholic Church, which had been in a kind of a constricted state for a long while. The modern centuries had not been kind to the Catholic Church, and vice versa. Those who got knocked into a defensive posture. And so, it, at times, it seemed almost like anything that moved was bad. Well, Teilhard moved. In fact, he got everything moving. In fact, he found not only that the Earth revolves around the sun, but that the universe itself is moving, moving in time. So Teilhard's background, I won't say much about it. He was born in 1881. He died in 1955 on Easter Sunday, by golly. Easter Sunday, symbolic for him. As you know, he was a geologist and then a paleontologist, okay? And it's interesting, he immersed himself so, so intensely into the past and into the remote past often, too. And then he became sort of an apostle of the future. In fact, he, uh, as it were, pushed things around and gave a new perspective on Christianity in which it becomes a forward-looking, forward-looking affair once again. From so many centuries when we had tended to live in a tunnel and uh, exhibited for being so cruel to the past, or the recent past, relatively recent past, and to, uh, to have a small vision in a way. There's a quote that I like to use from Isaiah. It's from the third servant poem, chapter 49 of Isaiah. You may remember this. It is too little a thing for you. The, the Lord is speaking to his servant. It is too little a thing for you to be my servant, to raise up the tribe of Jacob, and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations. Light to the nations. Lumen gentium. That's the title of the Vatican II Constitution on the Church. With good reason. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Okay, it is too little. That was what Father Teilhard, it is too little. That is, Christianity and Catholicism were too little. Too little for the world that they were in, and it was a world which had largely come out of Christianity, and yet Christianity with its structures, with its container, you might see, container. Because whenever... Uh, Whenever Catholicism particularly, I think, loses its energy, it tends to, it tends to withdraw into an Old Testament as it will. It tends to withdraw into a container, into a container which limits it as Israel was limited to the one nation, as it were, before the coming of Christ and the opening up, opening up the light to the nations, the light to the entire world. So Teilhard, we find, I think, makes a similar movement of expansion. But this time it's not to all the nations, but it's to somehow all of reality, it's to the universe. The title that was uh, originally proposed for uh, these talks had this part labeled as uh, Teilhard's engagement with the earth, but I uh, would like to diverge from that and talk about Teilhard's engagement with the universe, because that's what he represents to uh, Christians, I think, is a universe that makes sense makes sense in terms of their revelation, in terms of their faith. And a faith that makes sense in terms of the universe, that's quite an achievement, really. So it's amazing that he did what he was able to do. There are lots of, I have a whole sheaf of questions for Teilhard, okay? If you got his back against the wall and you forced him to give answers, to, you, could, you could question him all day, and you'd continue to find gaps. But the value of what he did remains. The value of what he said remains. The value of the vision that he projected for Christians remains. It remains because it's true, because it's valid. And it's a vision of hope. And it's not just a vision of facts, but it's a vision of prophecy. And a vision of, you might say, it's not just poetry, but there is poetry in science at a certain point, if you read it the way Teilhard did. Anyway, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So he was, um, he was a geologist first, collecting rocks, and I guess sending them back to France to put in some museum. <laughs> and then he was a paleontologist studying the antiquity of life, particularly, that is, relics of, uh, of earlier forms of life. And then he was a theologian, just by gift and not by education. I'm sure he got a theological education, the, the uh, Jesuit education of the times. But he was a theologian because that was a gift that God gave him, I think, okay, was to join his revelation with his science in a way which had never been done before. So that's what I'd like to talk about, basically. Evolution and Christianity. Um, he found that evolution and Christianity have a certain affinity to one another. In fact, 
evolution and the biblical God have a certain affinity to one another because evolution is a moving forward, okay? It's a moving forward in some way where more comes out of less, incredibly, okay? And that's what uh, the conservative, the scientific naturalist, okay, the reductionist, you might say, would deny. More cannot come out of less, but more comes out of less in evolution. And that's the promise of uh, that's the promise of God to Israel, isn't it? The promise of of Jesus, as it were, to to us, to his disciples, that more will come out of less. We'll elaborate on that a little bit. But there is a, an affinity between evolution and the God of promise, the God of a future. Because the God both of the of the Old Testament and of the New Testament is a God of promise, a promise and fulfillment, okay? A, a God who uh, says there's going to be more, and then a God who makes it true. A God of resurrection, of new creation, a God of a future. That's a fairly unusual thing among the religions, isn't it? A God of the future. But that's the kind of God we have. And so we live somehow on expectancy, that, that middle theological virtue of faith, hope, and charity, that middle theological virtue of hope, I think, has not had its day yet. It's not had its, its uh, enlightenment yet. It hasn't had its full noonday yet, at least for many centuries in Christianity. But Teilhard, I think, opens that. He opens that day of, of the sunburst of hope once again. Believing in a future. Believing in a future which is not just for us, it's not just a little picture of our souls, like in the next life. Where will I go? Where will I go when this life is over, okay? Will I go up or will I go down? That's not enough for Teilhard. It's not enough. It's too little. Where is it all going? Where is it all going? And will I go with it? Can I go with it? Can I help it go where it's going so that it'll carry me where it's going? That's his question. So it's a big liberation, really which uh, brings with it a, a sense of exhilaration. And as I say, there are all kinds of questions, all kinds of gaps, but the gaps don't diminish the size of the achievement. The gaps don't hurt the vision at all, really. And as ever, it's a matter of faith. Where he's coming from is faith. And it's not ultimately faith in science, it's faith in God. So the convergence of evolution and Christianity at Teilhard is very evident in that masterwork of his, the, the phenomenon of man, or the human phenomenon, as it's more accurately translated in the title, in the new uh, English translation, where he has what he calls the within of evolution, because normally evolution spreads out, doesn't it? In other words, the species multiply and they diverge, and it's like a fan which is opening up, which is spreading out. But Teilhard finds a, a within of evolution as well. And it's marvelous the way he does it, marvelous. Because he finds that the spearhead of evolution is not in all of the species. Where's the spearhead of evolution after all? It's in the human being. The spearhead of evolution is humanity. And humanity be, begins to be a conscious and deliberate and voluntary and creative evolution, okay? A, a reflective evolution which knows as it goes, you might say, which understands, which reflects, which chooses, which steers its direction, at least to some extent, and which can somehow respond to not just a cause from behind itself, but an attraction from in front of itself, an attraction from before it, not just being pushed from behind, but being pulled, pulled inside, internally. What was that? <laughs> oh, there's a, there's a microphone thing there. <coughs> That's not what a heart attack sounds like. That's, <laughs> that's just the technology. Yeah. <clears throat> so he has a number of what you could call revolutions, but they're one, all part of one big revolution, one revised vision, as it were, for Christianity. I'll say more about that conversion of evolution in Christianity in Teilhard as I go on. But that's where the magic comes from. He says science is analytical. What does he mean by that? Because there are, there's synthetic chemistry, by golly. I ought to know. And... There is synthesis in science, but as well as analysis. But what he means by analysis is that science has to reduce everything to its, its simplest elements, doesn't it? It's analytical in that sense. Analytical, it has to reduce, in order to understand things, it almost has to take them apart. It has to take them back to where they come from. It has to take them back to the elements which cause the, which are the material, what would you say, the material body of this, uh, of this reality, this phenomenon. But he says Christianity is synthetic. Christianity moves ahead and convergently, 
rather than back and what would you call it dispersively okay if you if you the the reductionist scientist will say well it all comes from matter okay and what's matter matter is atoms okay and then finer than atoms are, are uh, subatomic particles and so on okay Teilhard wants to go in the opposite direction because he says that's where Christianity goes is in the opposite direction instead of moving back towards the smallest the most multiple and most elementary things to explain something you move ahead to where it's going you move ahead to the goal for instance you don't if you want to understand evolution don't look back don't look back as he says to the uh, to the spring to, to understand the river don't look back to the, the source from which it comes look back to the estuary where it's going where it flows out where it ends up and that's where a lot of the magic in his vision comes from looking ahead so he would have us look ahead to what he calls the Christ Omega which is the ultimate point of convergence instead of a god just up above he has a god up ahead from a god just up above to a god up ahead a god who draws us forward rather than just inviting us upward okay so he brings spirituality also in that sense down to earth in a way but i won't go into that in detail he brings it down into uh, an embodied an incarnate situation which is after all what christianity is about okay christianity is not ultimately about ascending into heaven is it he would have us believe that christianity is a matter of our participating in the future of the universe and a universe which ultimately is glorified and which converges into the into the Christ omega he would talk about an omega, a god omega that god is the omega god is as carl ronner would say god is the absolute future okay god is our absolute future the absolute end the final terminus and then it becomes a christ omega a christ who has lived on earth as a single human being divine human being and who as glorified as, as you might say in a, in a multiple identity and then who ends up being the, the center of the convergence of all reality you remember those readings in ephesians and colossians where god had planned had, that all things should be summed up in him all things should be recapitulated in him all things should be brought together in unity in christ okay and in that way reach their goal that everything should be divinized in that sense it's incredible huh? the christianity is is bigger than we thought so my own perspective my own favorite point of view is that of a sapiential theology or a wisdom theology it sounds kind of vain but it's an old tradition in in christianity our theology up until the 13th century and the arrival of uh, aristotelian thought logic and scholasticism was a sapiential theology a wisdom theology which is more intuitive, intuitive and more biblical and doesn't use normally doesn't use philosophical concepts much it can but it likes the biblical language because in some sense it's it's got an infinite depth beneath it and an infinite full fullness in it at least in its key terms and its key moments so i would say that tayard is the uh, the prophet or the originator of a new sapiential theology and why is it new well first of all because it's looking ahead rather than looking behind and because it's not just synthesizing what already is but it is synthesizing in terms of a convergence into a goal which is newly envisioned that goal of the omega christ well, let me talk a little bit a little bit about tayard's revolutions but they pop out all over the place once you start looking for them they're all part of one revolution but uh they have distinctly different different uh, flavors to them first of all from past to future that is from being directed from something that's behind us as we talked about being caused by something behind us before being directed from something behind us but to being directed by something that is ahead of us so be, to be directed by the future to have our our nose as it were our attention drawn to the future so that that becomes our compass so that that's the needle of our compass you'll see more of that as we go on and you can even say i've, I've seen it uh, well said that tayard offers us the change from identification with the past to identification with the future it's an identification of the mind and it's an identification of the heart 
in which identification is a strong word for it, but I think it has, a, has a, an expansiveness to it, a sense to it that's important for us. An identification whereby you begin to find your influence, your source of energy and your source of vision there in the future rather than just the past. Because the past is indispensable, it's God's past, okay? Our past, which is God's work. But it's the future where he wants us to look, so Teilhard would suggest, and I certainly agree. God is future as Omega, whole Christ, the whole Christ. The whole Christ means not just the individual Christ, but Christ, the body of Christ is containing all of humanity. And in some way, using the same logic, you end up with the body of Christ is coextensive somehow with the universe. Father Robert brought that out, I believe, in a certain book of his, which is his, his doctoral dissertation, by golly, Christ in the Universe, on Teilhard, no less. From external causation to internal attraction, I've already mentioned that one. The relation of this to the Christ event, to the resurrection, to the Christ Omega. Think of the risen Christ. The risen Christ, the resurrection happened once, didn't it? But the risen Christ is ahead of us. The risen Christ is our future. That's where we're going. And that risen Christ is the Omega, of course. Salvation and spirit, revolution and spirituality, first from vertical to horizontal, not completely. And Robert will talk about the transcendent and Teilhard, I believe. But by and large, there's, as I said, a change from the God up above to the God up ahead. And our movement, our spiritual movement, also becomes largely a movement ahead rather than simply upward. Simply upward would be becoming more and more spiritual. Forward means somehow progressing with the universe, not out of it or from it, but within it somehow forward, in the, in the, in the movement of the universe, the very evolutionary movement of the universe. And if we're human beings, then we're part of the spearhead of that evolution of the universe, forward towards the God that's up ahead and the Christ that's up ahead. Revolution and spirituality number two is, this is in the Divine Milieu, that uh, spirituality book of Teilhard's, if you wish to call it that. His two uh, key books, I think, are The Phenomenon of Man, I mentioned it before, The Human Phenomenon and The Divine Milieu. The Human Phenomenon laying out the whole of his vision in some way. Evolution and Christianity uh, wedded together. And The Divine Milieu telling you, as it were, about the phases and the, the aspects of life, okay? The ups and the downs and the forwards and the backs of the human life and experience and development. Largely in growth and in diminishment, those two, those two vectors, the upward and the downward as it were, as we move ahead in life. Teilhard represents a birth of, a rebirth of participatory consciousness, I think, in Christianity. Um, when I, I mentioned that sapiential theology, well, the thing that d distinguishes sapiential or wisdom theology especially the Christian kind, is participation. T participation is a notion, I mean, it's a common, common word in our language, but it's a notion philosophically and theologically which has been largely forgotten by Christians as well as by others in the modern world because we think as individuals and we see things as individual things largely, okay? And we talk about their interactions and their permutations and their movements and so on. But suppose we think in a participatory way there was, there's a, a, a thinker called, what's his name? Owen Barfield, okay? Got a book called Saving the Appearances where he talks about an original participation or primal participation, you might say, where the human being is not yet differentiated from the mass, from the tribe, okay? And so thinks as the tribe thinks. And historians, I think, pretty well verify that, that, that uh, thinking used to be much more communal even if you, if you, maybe you can't even call it quite thinking yet, okay, before the individual mind has emerged. And then it became more and more individual. Remember the axial turn, the axial period, where the individual consciousness, the individual mind seems to sort itself out, differentiate itself from the mass, from the context, from the group. Group think, as they, as they say today. So, uh, Then he talks about 
is the, the primal uh, participation, or original participation that he puts. It's a marvelous vision. It's one insight. It's amazing, Ms. Barfield. Um, there's an original participation, then there's a loss of participation. And this you find, especially in our Western scientific consciousness, I think, okay, where everything is looked at in itself. It has to be separated out, individualized, and then examined, and then analyzed, okay? So a kind of loss of participation in our modern world. And then what he calls a final participation, where the participation, instead of being involuntary, hereditative, hereditary, hereditary, you might say, is spontaneous and creative. <clears throat> a creative participation in the world, in reality, in nature itself. So that's what Teilhard is largely talking about, is that progression. So he is the, uh, what would you say, the prophet of a new kind of participation, because it's not only in, what would you call it, it's not only in family or nation, of course, not only in the human race, and not only in Earth, but in the universe. And somehow the whole thing is moving with us, or we're moving with it. So a new participatory vision. It's more important than it sounds, and all of the words are not as long as participatory. I think Teilhard uh, represents a kind of rebirth of Christian hope. He's got a an article in a book of his called The Activation of Energy, in which he talks about uh, the zest for living as, as crucial for, uh, for evolution. And the zest for living, as it were, as the energy, as the engine of evolution. Zest for living particularly now, since the human person is the spearhead of evolution. Zest of living particularly in the, in the human person. It's something to be cultivated. But with him, it's much more than what we would ordinarily understand that as being. It's a, a, a zest for living which is wedded to a vision, which partly derives from a vision. And it's this total vision of his. To have a zest for living our life because we feel it as a participation in the, the movement of the whole thing. That the whole thing is moving, the whole thing is moving forward, the whole thing is progressing, and we're part of it. Not only are we part of it, but we're an active part of it. We're, in some way, an essential part of it. And so the way we steer our heart, in a sense, has an effect on this, on this movement that's happening. Either we go with the positive, or we fall out of it, or we resist it, or oppose it. We have that choice. Teilhard gives us a vision which is able to open us up, I think, to go with it. To go with it and to somehow to find our own creativity engaged in this very movement. This one big movement. So he's a big, uh, in some way, not an inventor of hope, okay, but you might say a, the rediscoverer of, of hope, inseparable from the big vision, the big picture. I think uh, Christians have underestimated the important of vision, importance of vision, okay, because for a time, I think our <clears throat> our Christianity, at least our Catholicism, was institutionalized to the extent that the vision was limited to what we are told. The vision was limited to that which came down from the top, as it were, from authority and from our own uh, reliable tradition. But suppose a vision is something that has to grow up with a certain spontaneity and freedom within each human being, okay? Well, some, somebody like Teilhard offers you a quantum leap in that kind of growth, a quantum leap in that kind of... Uh, that kind, of progressive, that kind of progressive, you could almost say rebirth, as Christianity itself offers a rebirth, as baptism offers a rebirth, and a rebirth of vision, as well as the energy of God in us, the spirit of God in us. Remember that Vatican II was a liberation of vision, a liberation of the, the freedom to envision for Catholics, for Catholic Christians, as the, uh, the kind of container was broken open once again. Again and again, it's like uh, Paul writing to the Galatians, you know, and saying, well, you used to be under the law. For heaven's sake, don't go back to that. Don't crawl back into that container. Don't go back into that tunnel. Don't go back into that tube. You've been freed. There's, there's one crazy line in, in Paul in his letter to the Galatians, for freedom, Christ set you free. You've been set free for freedom. <laughs> 
So that's the point of the whole thing. So don't give it up. Don't crawl back into that tunnel. Well, Teilhard offered us a, a door out of the tunnel insofar as we had one. I think while Catholicism was in its defensive posture, it was very diff difficult for anything new to be said, okay, and almost to be thought. But some people uh, got enough freedom somehow themselves to, to think and then to pass on that vision to others, and Teilhard was one of the most powerful of them. So he scared the daylights out of uh, the authorities sometimes. It's incredible that he was not allowed to publish any of his religious or philosophical, that is, any of his big ideas until after he was dead. I don't, I'm not implying that he published them after he was dead, only. <laughs> and, and I think probably the authority heaved a great sigh of relief when he died, okay, and then, and then began to, began to uh, call him holy, probably. And then suddenly they discovered all this stuff came out, <laughs> and they heaved a different kind of sigh. All right, where are we going? Hmm? <laughs> you should see how big my eyesight is such that I have to practically get one line on a page. That's page three, all right? We want four. What's that doing there? A little confusion here in my pages. I want to read a couple of uh, Pauline, or they call them Deutero-Pauline texts. One's from uh, Colossians and one's from Ephesians, because they seem to me to uh, to reflect where Teilhard is taking us, where Teilhard is going. Excuse me. The chapter and the verse. Yep, Colossians one, chapter one, thirteen to twenty. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness, transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for in him all things were created in heaven and in earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, principalities or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. You can save, savor every one of those words. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And then he's writing this to uh, people who are Gentiles, okay? rather than coming from the Jewish tradition. Then he talks to them, and you who were once estranged, remember you were far off and he has brought you close and made you one in the blood of his son Jesus. Ephesians chapter 1, 3 to 10. When, when we studied theology, Robert may remember this too, we had, guess who we had for our theology, uh, systematic theology professor, it was Cipriano Vagagini, remember? <laughs> and, and yeah, and he uh, gave us a class, De Grazia, or on grace, okay? And what it was, was largely a commentary on these very verses, uh, Ephesians chapter 1, 3 to 10. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. He destined us in love to be his children through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, that's in De Grazia, which he bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he has lavished upon us. Okay, and here's the big picture. 
for he has made known to us in all wisdom and insight the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him. To unite all things in him. That's the Omega that Teilhard writes about. So Teilhard's very largely coming from these texts, I believe. To unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Now the word there is a kind of a long one, anakephalaiosai. That means to recapitulate or to sum up, to head up all things in him. I had a a thing here about the the West. I used to be very devoted to to the East and its spirituality, and I've become a, a Westerner thoroughly. So the genius of the West and the vocation of the West, I think, can be envisioned from St. Paul to uh, Teilhard de Chardin in this fashion, that St. Paul breaks out of the container, the container, you might say, of an institutional religion, okay, of the law, as Paul himself says. He breaks out of that into a freedom which is somehow able to embrace all of reality and, first of all, all of humanity, because he breaks out of the container of the the Judaic people, the nation of Israel, into all human beings, right? Into the world of the Gentiles, out to the ends of the earth. So, and I see Paul as the father of the West in that way, because I think the East is where it started, in a sense. I I connect the the East with John. John, the beloved disciple. John, the uh, author, as it were, at least traditionally, of the Gospel of John and the first letter of John. Now, remember where Jesus says... uh, to Peter. Peter says, well, what about him? Remember, John is following them. The beloved disciple is following them down the road towards the end of the gospel. And Jesus said, don't worry about him. If he is to remain until I come, what's that to you? You follow me, remember? So it's the vocation of one to follow Jesus. It's the vocation of the other one somehow to stay where he is because he's already in Jesus. Remember how John was in the bosom of, of Jesus at the Last Supper? In John's gospel, at least. And remember how at the end of the prologue, the only, the only son or the only God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has made all things known. That's John's gospel. That's the, the prologue of John's gospel. As if John represents the one. Now, in the bosom of simply means one, one with, okay? It simply means he's divinized. And that's why you find those I am statements in John's gospel. So many of them, 17 of them, I think. Some of them were predicates, but a lot of them are just I am. That's the name of God in the Old Testament. Now, a scripture scholar will just uh, make the sign of the cross and and turn away when you say that. But I think it's there. I think it's unmistakable in John's gospel. So the Easterner, John, stays where he is because he is where everything is. Remember John's gospel begins, in the beginning was the word. In the beginning was the word. It's almost as if nothing happens in John's gospel. It's just a revelation, remember? And at the end of the prologue of John is, the one, the one God, they take that variant now, that translation, the, one, the only God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has made him known. As if nothing happened. As if there wasn't any cross and resurrection, okay? Now that's the other perspective. That's perspective as it was of Due East, you know. Um, but it's a matter of illumination. It's a matter of illumination and union. It's a matter of becoming one with God. <laughs> And the, the narrative is not nearly so important in John. It seems strange to say that, but I'm, I'm convinced of it. It's just the other side. It had to be revealed with a certain force, and so it's certainly done in John, both the gospel and the letter. <coughs> Whereas in Paul, the whole thing revolves around the death and resurrection of Jesus. There has to be an event. Something has to happen. Like in John, it's like it's all revelation. It's all illumination. It's all union. Because to know, to know in this way is to be one with is divinization. For Paul, it's the narrative that's important. John is the East, Paul is the West in that sense, okay? Well, from Paul to what they are, what do I mean by that? So Paul brings us out of the the container of Judaism, as it were, into the fullness of the nation, the fullness of the Gentiles, or all of humanity virtually, okay? Where does Teilhard bring us? He brings us out of a container, you might say, at that time of institutional Catholicism and of a vision which was, for most of us, I think it was about our relationship with God and where it was going, okay? 
will we be saved or will we be lost? Will we become saints or will we not? Will we go up or will we go down? But Teilhard liberates us from that. Liberates us from that by joining us with the whole of the creation and giving us a kind of fundamental optimism, a fundamental sense of participation in everything that God has made, that it's all good and so are we and we're all going in the same direction. And we have some kind of role to play in it. We have some kind of role to play in it. Our freedom is vital to it in some way. The creative juices that we have in us, the generativity that we're gifted with. Generativity is, is one thing on the, on the sexual level, okay? It's another thing on the, you might say, the, the human and the spiritual level. What happens when uh, people are not generating anymore on the physical level? They're not having children, okay? Is there is still a genera generativity there? I believe there is, okay? And it has to do with what we're talking about here. And children are the future, aren't they? Well, this other generativity is about a future too, okay? And it's our personal future. It's the future of those that we know and love. It's the future of all humanity. But it's also the future of the universe. You can even say that it's, it's God's future. It's certainly the future of Jesus, okay? Because that's where he's becoming what he's, what he's meant to be from the beginning. So I would contend that the genius of the West is a kind of expansive genius. Also in science and so on, the explorations, even the colonialism, all of that, the domination of the West, that's, uh, a lot of that is an abuse of its fundamental gift and its fundamental genius, which is the expansiveness, the movement outward, the movement to reach the limits, the movement somehow to embrace everything, okay? That's the gift of the West. And so you can see it very clearly in Paul. It's the basic central dynamic of his life and of his writing, of his work. And you can see it in Teilhard. Teilhard in this sense of, this sense particularly of vision and breaking out of a certain container that we managed to close against ourselves or close around ourselves once again and busting it open and giving us the whole vision once again in power and in luminosity. And in between, of course, you've got a lot of other expansive things going on in the West that didn't happen in the rest of the world or only happened after the, the West started, okay? After the West lit the fuse somehow. Whether they be scientific things or, or political things or other human advances of all kinds, which have taken on an expansiveness in the West that's never happened anywhere else in the same way or until uh, carried on from the West. Time for it. Thank you very much.